Welcome to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe with Ronnie Dahl in the studios of our flagship stations, Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM. Civic Center TV is on Comcast Channel 15 and at and t Channel 99. We're also joined on those same channels by Birmingham Area Municipal Access. In addition today, as always, on the radio, 89.3 Lakes FM, of course, and 88.1 WBFH, the BIF. The BIF is a service of the Bloomfield Hills School District with operations out of Bloomfield Hills High School under the leadership of station manager Ron Winnables. Today we're also online on civiccentertv.com. Click on our Watch Live link and you can watch the entirety of our show live in high definition, civiccentertv.com, as well as our show our other original and imported programming and replays of the Megacast throughout the afternoons, evenings, and on the weekends. Today, as always, we are joined by an, another partner on Facebook via Facebook Live. Today, that partner is the West Bloomfield Fire Department. We'll be joined shortly by their chief, Greg Flynn, here on the show to talk about the latest in the pandemic response from the West Bloomfield Fire Department and other neighboring areas. That and more are our family of TV and radio stations as well as other media outlets. Not just a regular broadcast, not just a regular simulcast, not just a team effort. It is a little bit of everything encompassed into a, a number of community television, radio, and other media outlets to bring you the latest information about COVID-19 and other important news stories in Oakland County and the surrounding areas. And uh, one place you can find all of that information and more is on our website on civiccentertv.com. So if you look at, at it, here's our, our website, or here's our homepage for those watching on TV and on, and on the internet. CivicCenterTV.com, if you click on our coronavirus link, that will take you to a page that has information from the Centers for Disease Control, the state of Michigan, Oakland County, and many of our local municipalities in our coverage area, as well as stories uh, updated each and every day before our live shows. And today, our top, our top story, fall favorite cider mill is going to stay closed. The popular Michigan cider mill will not open this fall because of the pandemic. Plymouth Orchards and Cider Mill won't open because the COVID-19 pandemic has presented too many public health obstacles for us to open safely, according to a posting on its Facebook page. We believe the, that opening this year would be risky for our Cider Mill team and our Cider Mill guests, they also said in that statement. The mill said it will make a decision with it made a decision with a heavy heart and that it is the first time the mill will have closed its doors in the more than 35 years since it has been open. On Wednesday, Michigan recorded nine deaths and 517 cases of the novel coronavirus. The state's overall tally reached 89,271 and the death toll reached 6,273, according to the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. So, Ronnie, businesses continue to be heavily affected affected by this pandemic. Many have reopened, but seasonal businesses now making their decision for the fall, and that's going to affect probably a lot of cider mills where there's a lot of human interaction with, with these goods that they are selling, and there often are places that people gather in, in, in heavy numbers to pick up these, these fall staples, such as cider, donuts, apples, whatever the case may be, and the Plymouth Orchards and Cider Mill, the first of possibly many of these kinds of institutions that may not be operating come fall. Tyler, I was so bummed when I saw this because I have to say it's not fall until you go to the cider mill and you get that fresh cider and you have the little battle with all the bumblebees still flying around. It's like it, it, it just says this is fall. And I would imagine a lot of these businesses probably thought that they were going to escape this because they were closed. And then we were thinking, hopefully this would be over by the time fall time came around, but it's not. So I think this is going to be a big disappointment for a lot of people because it is a family tradition every single year around this time. And, and this is the first of potentially many in the local area that may shut down. And there are, it's always a favorite for a lot of people, but people love to go to cider mills in the fall in Michigan. It's one of those staple activities of that season. And it's going to be disappointing, for, I think, for a lot of people that another great tradition of our of uh, the autumn season may not be in place this year because of COVID-19. Other top stories, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus, Beaumont Health tightens visitor hours. 
Beaumont Health announced it will no longer allow visitors to its Farmington Hills Hospital because of a rise in novel coronavirus cases at that campus. A quote from them, over the past few days, we have had multiple staff, patients, and visitors test positive for COVID-19. That's why out of an abundance of caution, we are temporarily restricting visitors at our Farmington Hills campus, said Mark Geary, a spokesman for Beaumont Health. Starting at 8 a.m. today, no visitors will be allowed at, in the rooms of patients who have COVID-19 or those who are awaiting test results except at end of life or other extreme circumstances. So this is the first time in a while we've seen hospital, a hospital or a hospital system taking action to prevent people from coming into their building as in a, an abundance of caution due to a COVID-19 outbreak. And they said that it's been with uh, both patients and staff and visitors getting COVID-19 at their Farmington Hills campus. So Beaumont Health limiting visitor hours, at least at that campus for now, while they get that under control. Yeah, it's just this one campus right now. So people should know that because you have to remember hospitals have actually taken a huge financial hit during this pandemic. So it was vitally important for them to be able to reopen their hospital doors for other procedures so that they can continue to get the cash flow going again. So they like to remind everyone that it is safe for people to come back to the hospital. So for them to put this out, they know that there could be a ripple effect, but they want people to know it's just this one location for just this time. Right, and it is just this one, lo just that one location. They have not made any indication that any of their other campuses, and that we haven't heard anything from any of our other local health systems that they're doing anything of the of the similar nature. So this is just an, an isolated incident. They're doing their due diligence to let the community know they're taking immediate action and and stringent action to prevent the the further spread of COVID-19. So they can get that under control. Treat the people that need to be treated, do the cleaning they need to, to, uh, to do to make sure that that facility is sterilized from COVID-19 and then get back to regular business. So uh, keep updated on that. We have that article on our website. You can get more details from that, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. That and other stories, including our last new story today, a push to revamp Michigan's bottle deposit law, Michigan's 10 cent deposit law on beer pop and other bottles and cans enacted in 1976 has been wildly successful in getting those receptacles recycled. But those involved in making, distributing and collecting those bottles and cans say the law needs revamping. Organizations including the Michigan Beer and Wine Wholesa Wholesalers Association wanted a greater portion of the revenues from unredeemed bottle and can deposits to go to recycling programs, beverage distributors, and police to help stop deposit fraud. But the Department of Environment, Great Lakes, and Energy, or EGLE, officials say that doing so would take already insufficient funding away from programs to clean up contaminated sites statewide. Total refund in Michigan, refunds in Michigan may, ranged from $346 million to $425 million per year since 2000, according to the Michigan Department of Treasury. More than $80 billion in bottles and cans accumulated unreturned in people's closets and garages during the COVID-19 stoppage, and some of those returnables were likely discarded in trash as people ran out of room, industry representatives say. And, and that became more apparent as time went on, as people were trying to figure out ways to uh, get rid of those cans, whether it be by donations, whether it be by simply cutting their losses and trashing those cans. So a lot of those weren't getting returned. And then when they are able to be returned, there are limits in place at, at several locations. You can only return so many cans per day. So people that have been building up this collection for months on months on months have to go back in several trips. And some either get fed up and just say, okay, we'll trash whatever's left, cut our losses and move on. Or they're struggling to find other ways to, to, to return these cans in some situations where these receptacles fill up really quickly with the rest of the people in the community and they have to wait for a long period of time. This system is broken. So just like so many other industries, the pandemic and this crisis has exposed issues that were already there, but now are being highlighted. And one of those being this system in that money is not being put back into the system and how you recycle. And for a lot of these um, companies, you may be able to go to like a Kroger or Costco or Meyer to be able to return them because they have the conveyor belts. So it's not as time consuming, but you're seeing a lot of the other 
regular stores like you know the gas station on the corner they're still not taking them back so we are seeing a backlog so what they want to say is hey let's go ahead and put more money into this system so there is an easier way for us to be able to recycle them because i will tell you during this whole pandemic this has been my pet peeve like you would not believe and we finally gave up and did just that tossed them yeah and that's happening with a lot of people i've had some can buildups too that accumulated over time i was able to return them in a couple of different trips um, and I've made another trip since then with another uh, grouping of cans that have been collected in a much shorter period of time. But a lot of frustration can come from people, that, especially if they're living in a smaller facility. And that space, that takes up a lot of space. And eventually you need that for more productive things than hoarding cans, waiting for the system to be back in place. And then they also have these returning, these uh, collection agencies that are taking these cans back and doing the actual recycling they're asking for more money as well because they're now getting overloaded with all these things with all these cans bottles and so on that they have to be able to recycle and they're also losing a lot of that revenue too that's coming in from recycling those because of how much of the of those accumulations of cans bottles and so on are ending up in the trash so that and more stories on our website, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. In addition, you can find resources about COVID-19 and stay up to date from trusted information from the Centers for Disease Control, the state of Michigan, Oakland County, and many of our local municipalities. So if you live in Sylvan Lake and need Sylvan Lake's information, you can click on their link on our website and go straight to their COVID-19 page. Same with you in Rochester Hills and those in West Bloomfield Township as well. Or you can stay tuned right here on our, on our program on the Oakland County Megacast where we are regularly speaking with experts on COVID-19 in the community. Experts such as West Bloomfield and Tri-City Fire Department Fire Chief Greg Flynn, who now joins us on the Oakland County Megacast once again. Chief Flynn, thank you for being with us today. Good morning. Good morning. Good to have you on. How are you? How's the team at the fire department been? We are doing well. I'm coming to you today from uh, Station 1, 4601 Orchard Lake Road. We're just wrapping up our physical agility uh, physical ability candidate test for some new hire uh, firefighter paramedics. Um, so you see uh, quite a few trucks behind me and some of our staff here that's outside enjoying this. I think this is a much more beneficial camera shot than me from all the shadows and poor lighting inside my office. So it's good to be out here and showing our residents, uh, some of their firefighters at work and, and one of the fire stations here in the township, one of the six. Chief, you mentioned about some of the new recruits. For those people that aren't familiar with what it takes to become a member of your team, what is the recruiting process and what are some of the things that they have to go through? All right, that's a great question. And, and public safety across the board, police, fire, EMS, uh, have been struggling here. We had a big surge after 9-11, many people wanting to join uh, the ranks of those in public service. Uh, and over time, that kind of has waned uh, to the point where uh, we're lucky to get uh, seven or eight candidates. Uh, myself, uh, Chief Morin, you've had on the show from Bloomfield Township, Chief Menifee from Southfield. Uh, and I know uh, uh, the city of Warren is, uh, has many uh, vacancies uh, in the rank of firefighter. Uh, we're looking, many of those agencies that I mentioned, we would love for the candidates to have their paramedic license already and to have their firefighter one and two training, which is uh, provided at many of the community colleges here in Oakland, Wayne and Macomb uh, counties. And uh, having those two credentials are ideal candidates, uh, but we've even had to modify those to say, hey, we'll hire you as a paramedic and then we'll send you to Oakland Community College or Macomb Community College to the fire academy for 10 or 11 weeks to get that certification. We're gonna hire you, pay you to go, and then you'll come back and fully join the department here and, and go to work. So we've had to, we've had to modify that because over time, the, the desire to serve in those public servant jobs seems to have uh, changed the trajectory and just doesn't seem to be as appealing to the masses. Well, Chief Flynn, the appeal maybe has changed, but the need certainly has. And how critical is it for fire departments and other public safety institutions to continuously have these new recruits coming in? Well, it's very important, Tyler. As you know, municipal governments work on a very uh, uh, refined budget, and uh, we do. We're, we're very uh, grateful for the taxpayers and uh, the dollars that they pay to meet their expectations for the service that they get in return for those taxes. So, when we have our budgeted positions lying uh, vacant, 
delivering those services, uh, we are much more innovative in how we, uh, how we have to do that. So when you take uh, a reduction in the number of qualified candidates, you look back and say 25 uh, plus years ago, hiring was good. So you have many people on the workforce that are becoming eligible to retire. Then we like we, we take a, a COVID pandemic layer and put on top of that, which is impacting those that may want to retire and those that may want to join uh, public service. It really is this storm. I don't want to, if I want to call it perfect and jinx myself, because I'm sure they can add something else into the mix there, whoever that is. But um, it has made it challenging for chiefs across the state and quite frankly, across the country to get qualified candidates that are coming into the field for the right reasons to serve the public with a servant's heart and uh, to take these these really good jobs. They really are a, a good job in West Bloomfield, the, the township board here and uh, the Tri-City a fire board takes very good care of the firefighter paramedics here at the WBFD. Chief Greg Flynn with us from the West Bloomfield Fire Department on the Oakland County Megacast. The fire department, of course, our Facebook partner on today's program. So we appreciate all of you tuning in live via Facebook Live for the entirety of today's Oakland County Megacast. If you're just tuning in, you can tune in Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 12 noon. So Chief Flynn transitioning to COVID-19. Uh, the, re the response has been has kind of plateaued a little bit. We've had case numbers that have mostly hit a plateau, a couple little spikes here and there. Give us an update on how West Bloomfield and the Tri-Cities are faring in terms of COVID-19. Yeah, so I would agree with your assessment that the response has started to taper off. And so we remain in this mitigation and a uh, kind of recovery phase, if you will. Uh, that doesn't imply that response is over. I don't want to be misleading there, but long-term planning really is in, in, in the, into mitigation and into recovery. And you're seeing that with, uh, I, I'm sure you had uh, County Executive uh, Coulter on the show and you talk about the CARES Act and how that money is going to local businesses and municipalities. That's part of recovery. Uh, we continue to see mitigation efforts where when you go into the uh, local uh, government office, you're going into the city Kigo uh, town hall, and you're seeing the plastic shields up or at your local grocery store. Uh, you're seeing people being very respectful and wearing their face coverings. Those are our mitigation. Those are slowing the spread of COVID-19 and our communities continue to do an exceptional job at that. And I know so many news outlets, that's what I love about the Megacast is we get to, to give an accurate narrative of what's going on in our communities. And our residents are doing, uh, are often doing the right thing. And uh, I want to thank them on behalf of all the frontline workers, whether they're healthcare providers directly within our hospitals or our first responders on the street. Thank you for doing those things, washing your hands, your physical distancing and your face coverings. That trifecta is our solution to mitigation. So, Chief, you guys do paramedic as well as fire. Talk a little bit your response on the paramedic side. Have you have the numbers gone down? Are you back to responding to regular type incidents? Ronnie, we have um, our, our I want to compliment to our dispatchers that first link in this chain of survival of, of pre hospital care is uh, we're still screening all the callers, even on a house fire, even on an odor investigation or a smoke alarm. They're getting the information in. They're starting the response and then they're asking that caller some key questions that may alert first responders to have a higher acuity for responding to that scene with additional PPE or just with our standard safe response for our first responders. Um, so we're doing well with all of that. And again, it's because our residents are forthcoming with the information. They know they're part of the solution and uh, that's what's making us successful. So I get a report every day that tells me the number of COVID positive uh, screenings that we have that's different than a COVID test that's just our screening process and we're seeing those numbers very low uh, somewhere sub 10 on a daily basis which is really positive. So with those numbers low how as a leader is it for you to be able to keep that momentum going to the people that work under you to remind them that this is still out there and to keep their guard up because you see it just like us in the public people tend to start letting their guard down during this time? Well, uh, I think that that's part of my role and the leadership team here 
Um, and the staff of firefighter paramedics that are here make our job easier because they're, they're such critical thinkers. They know that this is when we become most vulnerable. As soon as we say, hey, some of these things don't make sense. I can wash my hands less. I can get closer to people. It just doesn't make sense. So they keep doing the right thing, just like our residents do. And I, that's our success strategy. I had some a discussion with some colleagues the other day as we're looking at influenza season coming, that part of the speculation and part of our conversation is that we may be positioned very well because these social behaviors now, because it's not just a practice, these are behaviors. You probably notice now when you engage with someone in public, you naturally create space. This is now becoming a behavior. We've been doing it so long. That's gonna position us very well for when influenza comes through. The very virus that we deal with every flu season, flu, influenza, interchangeable terms, uh, we're going to be well positioned for that because we're doing these best practices. And uh, I, I guess to, to loop right back there, as I uh, like to sometimes navigate away from your questions, um, is that, uh, being a cheerleader for the team is an important role of all of the leaders within our local business and within community. And again, when you have a team that you're cheering on, that is the professionals like the men and women here at the WBFD and the WB, uh, WBPD, uh, the Tri-Cities uh, Police Department, so the Orchard, Kego and Sylvan, the job is made much easier when you're working with a, a group of professionals like these, these men and women. Chief Greg Flynn with us. He's the West Bloomfield Fire Chief and the Chief of the Tri-City Fire Department, which serves uh, Kego Harbor, Orchard Lake, and Sylvan Lake as well. With us on the Oakland County Megacast, the Fire Department, our Facebook partner today. So, Chief Flynn, uh, transitioning from the Fire Department and the, the firefighter and paramedic angle of response to that of the community, we've seen recently more reports of spread of the virus through private gatherings such as grad parties and and just individual parties mostly with younger people as well can you speak to the community about the importance of even in these times where people are celebrating rites of passage and sending people off to new opportunities particularly with younger people how important it is to avoid those kinds of private gatherings even with people that you're close with in life to prevent the spread of the virus yeah, and I need to walk a little bit carefully here because there are so many events that are so important to us, whether they're family events, religious events, community events. And really, I think the thing that we want to instill, and first and foremost, is to abide by the governor's executive orders and I completely support that. Um, but there are times that come where families are coming together and uh, you may be exceeding that number slightly. And, and one of the things that you talked about with uh, before this interview was with Beaumont and changing some of their uh, visitation policies for end of life issues and, and critical decision making uh, as far as medical care. Uh, we need to be thinking critically too. And uh, there are gonna be times that we come together. I have a high school senior this year. Our grad party was way different than what I grew up with or what my siblings uh, what we had when any of my uh, five brothers and sisters, uh, when we threw parties for them, it's different, Tyler. And we need to acknowledge that and not hold on to the past and say, we're gonna force the past into this pandemic. What we need to say is, what are we trying to accomplish? How can we accomplish and still make it great for this senior, a great anniversary party, a great birthday party, a great first birthday that we want our loved ones to experience it. And we just need to do it smart. and. People need to not attend those things when they're not feeling well. People need to stay home and send a video message if they have a pending uh, a COVID test or they're still symptomatic. Um, we don't do those things. But again, if we're healthy and we're keeping some physical distance and we're using hand sanitizer and washing our hands and we can space our chairs out and do something safely, we need some social engagement. We need a sense of community. We just need to do it in a smart way. So. I'm walking gently here because I think what we as community leaders need to acknowledge is that our residents need a sense of community. And we've gone a long time without that. And so we need to find balance and the community needs to understand that the leadership within, within government is trying to reduce and balance the spread of COVID. And so we need patience, we need kindness, we need compassion. And together we're going to be able to navigate this and, and find a path to keep our numbers low and have that sense of community and, and family and, and uh, 
just that togetherness that so many of us are really, really, truly longing for again, especially when you have weather like this. We've definitely had a great summer, which is kind of added to everyone wanting to be outdoors. Uh, real quick, I want to ask you a little bit about the budget. I know the CARES Act has helped kind of bridge that gap for some uh, organizations. How are you guys on your budget and do you think there's going to be a shortfall or are you prepared for the next fiscal year? Uh, I do not think there will be a shortfall. We've been aggressive on the CARES Act funding for all four communities that we serve. Uh, we have a great budget team here in West Bloomfield that is looking, working with the assessor's office, working with finance, working with our elected officials. I think we are going to be well positioned with reserves and other dollars that we have out there to put the team together, keep our community safe, keep the service delivery there, keep building, keep permitting, keep all of these things going. Albeit they may not be at the, the turnaround times and meeting all the expectations of pre-pandemic, uh, the effort of all the department heads in the township and the other three communities of the Tri-Cities is to keep the communities moving forward. And I'm confident that we're going to do that as a team with the community being uh, a team member in that uh, in that process. So I know the big issue at the beginning of this was getting accurate PPE. I know the supply chain has loosened up. It's a little bit easier, but will you be prepared if there's a second wave? And does some of that PPE have a shelf life? So we will be prepared. We were prepared on the front end of this for the initial round where we noticed in our after action review that we needed an improve was the vulnerability of the supply chain. And so that in mind makes you readjust your reserve and the number of days you wanna have that reserve for. For example, if we were assuming that our supply chain is a 10 to 14 day turnaround time, then one might assume I want 10 to 14 days of supplies so that I then can resupply them in a reasonable time. We're now extending that supply chain out and we know that that can be influenced by high demand nationally, if not globally. So we're extending that. Supplies are starting to come in again. N95 masks are coming on the market at reasonable pricing. And so we're starting to re replenish those things. As far as shelf life goes, uh, I think there's plenty of credible white papers and research that on many of the PPE items that the shelf life can be extended uh, if they're in the box, haven't been exposed to sunlight, extreme temperatures, so on and so forth, that would degrade the fibers within that protective gear. So I think that shelf life, if, if I understand your question correctly, Ronnie, is I would say that we can extend that and it's safe to do so. Chief Greg Flynn with us from the West Bloomfield Fire Department. Chief Flynn, just another few minutes with you before we got to let you go. Anything else that's important for our audience to know, for the people of West Bloomfield and the Tri-Cities to know, or anything else that you'd like to touch on today with us? Well, I would like to start looking forward to the future a little bit um, and, and preparing people, especially as there's so much discussion about going back to school. Two points. Number one is that uh, I don't want to forget about our educators and uh, I'm married to one, so obviously it's very uh, close to my family. And just encouraging people to, again, be patient as many uh, educators are going to a full remote uh, learning uh, style, that educators be patient with parents as uh, they navigate what that looks like. Um, and just taking a breath as we all settle in, as you've heard me say before, when big, big events are coming up like the start of school, or shutting down the state and things like this when we've discussed big things impacting the broader southeastern Michigan region. Take a breath. The other thing I want to keep an eye on is as we're moving into September, which is uh, Suicide Prevention Month, is we start bringing some of those things, the casualties, if you will, of social distancing, physical distancing, this isolation, that we continue to see that need for emotional health and wellness. And I would encourage members of our resident of our communities to reach out to uh, if there is a suicide prevention line um, uh, to clergy, uh, faith based organizations, counselors. Um, don't let these emotional uh, or uh, uh, mental health issues build up. We know that we have better outcomes when we address them sooner. 
And now we're going to be taking some steps here at the WBFD to highlight that into September. And hopefully we can talk about that more uh, as we get closer. Uh, but that's an important, something we, we clo hold very close to our heart when we lost uh, Lieutenant Jeff Hiltner to death by suicide. Um, our department is really taking a more proactive approach towards that. And that has led us to a more proactive approach within our community. And so I want to highlight that. And maybe Tyler, that's something we can build into the program uh, moving into September. Uh, as that is, is something very important to our community. We know that suicide, death by suicide is the 10th leading killer of, uh, of Americans. Um, and uh, it has been in the 10th place for some time now. It hasn't moved. So it's in the top 10 and, and we need to take it seriously. Just like we do with COVID, just like we do with heart disease, lung disease, cancer. Uh, it's very important. And I appreciate the time to highlight that today. Well, we thank you for, for being out with us today, Chief. Okay, take care. You as well. Chief Greg Flynn from the West Bloomfield Fire Department with us on the Oakland County Megacast. And, and Chief Flynn and his team continue to do great work and inform the community not just about COVID-19, but other key health crises in our community and help, help us help e each other as well. It's important to have leaders such as him to come together, lead their team. But like he mentioned, too, the great thing about this program, Tyler, is that we do allow people the time to be able to talk at length about so many of the issues. We're not cutting it down into a 10 second soundbite. So you get to hear directly from the leaders to learn about things that they are working on. One good point, as he mentioned, was going into flu season. I had never even thought about that, that hopefully because of all the precautions that everyone is taking due to COVID-19, that is going to help lessen the flu numbers going into October, November, and December. Yeah, and, and with everything that we've put in place and with the symptoms of flu and COVID-19 being so similar, all that more reason and motivation to, to keep those precautions in place, to keep your distance, to wear your mask, to social distance, and, and to follow those guidelines so that we can prevent a crisis on top of a crisis that can also create some confusion uh, when flu and COVID-19 ultimately do mix into one another uh, in the fall and into the winter months as well. So uh, with that, we'll take a quick break. We'll come back and we'll speak with the executive director of the Bowling Centers Association of Michigan. That and more coming up. You are watching and listening to the Oakland County Megacast on a family of TV and radio stations. Ronnie and I will return after this break. Hi, I'm Dr. Faust, the medical director for the Oakland County Health Division. The most important thing you can do to prevent the spread of illness is to wash your hands thoroughly and often. Follow these six easy steps every time you wash your hands. Step one, turn on the sink and wet your hands with warm water. Step two, apply soap to your hands and lather between your fingers, under your nails, and the front and back of your hands and wrists. Step three, wash your hands by scrubbing them together for at least 20 seconds. Step four, rinse your hands with warm, clean water. And step five, dry your hands with a clean cloth towel, a paper towel, or hot air blow dryer. If you're using a cloth towel, make sure to change it often. For handheld faucets, turn off the water using a paper towel instead of your bare hand. Step six, if you're using a paper towel, throw it away. Practice healthy habits like washing your hands after coughing or sneezing into them to keep you and others healthy. Go to oakgov.com health or call Nurse on Call at 1-800-848-5533 to learn more. Michigan, the coronavirus pandemic has put us all to the test. And now it's time to put COVID-19 to the test. As we move forward, testing will be critical. We encourage anyone who has reason to get tested to do so. Those with symptoms and those without. If you are leaving home and going back to work, get tested. If you think you may have COVID-19 or you've been exposed recently through family, friends, or coworkers, get tested. Our test locator tool can help you find the right testing site that fits your needs. Even if you're looking for easy access with no cost, no prescription, and no appointment necessary, we've got you covered. Help Michigan move forward, not backward. To find a testing site or learn more, visit michigan.gov slash coronavirus test. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Michigan, we still need to stay careful because we don't want to go backwards. 
back to where we started. So keep standing six feet apart. Keep wearing a mask in public. And if you have symptoms, talk to a healthcare provider about getting tested. To move forward, let's all do our part. So stay careful. Michigan.gov slash coronavirus. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keith with Ronnie Dahl in the studios of Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM. In addition, today, as always, we are on 88.1 WBFH, the Biff, and on Birmingham Area Municipal Access. Both of our TV channels on Comcast Channel 15 and AT&T Channel 99. We're also on the web on CivicCenterTV.com and on the West Bloomfield Township Fire Department's Facebook page. We appreciate it them for joining us today and all of you tuning in for the first time today on the West Bloomfield Fire Department's Facebook page. Thank you for tuning in. You can watch us live from 10 a.m. to 12 noon, Monday through Friday on our family of TV, radio, and other media outlets online for replays on civiccentertv.com slash megacast where we have the latest news and information about the, the COVID-19 pandemic and much more. Also, if you are unable to tune in to our live shows and maybe you don't have the time necessarily to go through and watch an entire replay of our two-hour program, go to civiccentertv.com slash megacast. We also have full interviews, so if you want to specifically watch our interview with Greg Flynn today, you can check that out later on this afternoon on civiccentertv.com slash megacast by clicking right here for those of you watching on TV and the web on watch full interviews, or if you just need short, quick bites of information, you can watch short clips as well. Also on civiccentertv.com slash megacast, we have information about the great community radio and television partners in our community, including 88.1 WBFH the Biff, a direct link to their website. You can find out more about what they're doing with their student radio broadcasters there as they approach the school year and Birmingham Area Municipal Access. All of that and more about our program is on civiccentertv.com slash megacast as we continue to bring you the latest news and information about the COVID-19 pandemic. And that news includes bowling alleys getting frustrated about still being closed to this day during the pandemic. They believe they can safely reopen and joining us to talk about how they believe they can do that is Bo Gergen. He is the executive director of the Bowling Centers Association of Michigan with us now on the Oakland County Megacast. Bo, thank you for being with us today. Thanks for having me. How are you? How is everybody at the association doing? Uh, we're, we're frustrated. Uh, we want the administration to listen to um, our plea, our cause. Um, we spent yesterday at the Capitol uh, doing a rally, we had about 300 folks there from all around the state, a very peaceful rally, uh, trying to educate the administration who we are as an industry and why we can open up safely. So, Bo, previously we had salon owners, we had salon and other personal service owners that had uh, congregated together to create a plan for safe reopening and sent that to the governor's office. They had plans for how they could reopen and operate safely under the COVID-19 guidelines. Similarly with the bowling alleys in, in our state, what would they be doing in this case to reopen and do so safely for the public while allowing these businesses to operate after being down since March? Well, we've done the same thing uh, back in April. We, we had our uh, association task force put a preparedness plan together with protocols on uh, all the necessary things that following CDC and OSHA guidelines uh, from sanitation to um, temperature checks at the door. Uh, an average bowling center size in the state of Michigan is 24 lanes and encompasses about 30,000 square feet. So we feel we've already eliminated the social distancing issue uh, with all the other uh, industries that are open with that are much smaller in, in space. Um, so with all the PPE products that are out there, all of our operators have purchased those in uh, understanding that we would be open by now. And uh, we were good citizens when this all started. And now June 15th came around and our fall season starts September 1 and here we are 
August 13th, still haven't heard from the administration of the reasons why we're closed and have a dialogue to discuss what we need to do to be open in their eyes. So, Bo, this is Ronnie. I would imagine that a lot of the owners and operators of the bowling alleys are getting pretty nervous because that uh, savings has to be running dry and they have to probably be pretty close to the risk of closing. I know you guys filed a lawsuit. Talk a little bit about the lawsuit and what you hope to get out of that. Well, the lawsuit was our last desperation. Um, again, being shut down for five months, no one in their right mind would have imagined anything like that happening, uh, particularly our uh, proprietors throughout the state. Um, so uh, we felt we've had no other alternative at this point than to file a lawsuit. Uh, we feel that the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments have violated our opportunity to operate our business uh, in due process. Uh, we're hoping that we'd never get to uh, court if we can sit down with the administration and go over our uh, preparedness plan. We feel it's very safe. Now, I want to remind everybody listening that Bowling has been going on in 45 states, uh, some since May, and not in one state or one bowling center in those 45 states have we had one super spreader incident with COVID-19. So how are these other 45 states doing this and the five states that are still closed haven't even had an opportunity to show that we can provide a safe environment, not only for our employees, but for our customers. We've seen other industries go the lawsuit route as well, the gyms as well as the theaters. And so far, the judge has not overturned the, uh, you know, the governor's executive order, and they're still closed. Does that discourage you? It's it's not. uh, I I don't have a ton of confidence that we'll win uh, based on uh, what's gone on before. But I think since the fitness centers and the theaters um have uh lost their cases Uh, we have a little bit more ammunition due to a couple more eos that have uh come across that don't make any sense now casinos are open and bowling centers aren't uh is it the touch points that we're talking about since we've pretty much handled the social distancing we pretty much handled all the safety protocols with plexiglass at each station uh, disinfecting wipes throughout the bowling center Uh, hand sanitizer throughout the bowling center. Uh, We can sanitize the shoes, the balls, the keypads that people may use. Uh, We can separate uh, groups on the lanes. Um, Mask is mandatory. So now with mask mandatory and they work and social distancing works, what other reason? And the only thing I can come up with is touch points. And I, I make this presentation. Our house balls and house shoes seem to be the element that uh, of concern. What's the difference between those and a shopping cart and a basket at a grocery store? Bo Gergen with us. He is the executive director of the Bowling Centers Association of Michigan, who has currently filed a lawsuit against the state in order to allow bowling alleys to reopen. And you mentioned that your fall season begins on September 1. For those that maybe aren't familiar or don't, or don't think about it from this angle, it's not just those everyday patrons like Ronnie and I that come in to, to, bowl, a fr- to bowl a frame or, f- or a few games through that are bringing the profits to these, to these bowling alleys. A lot of times it's also league play as well. Yeah, I would say that the uh, uh, bowling league uh, customer base is anywhere from 60 to 90% of a bowling center's operations. So there are now some family entertainment centers that still have bowling leagues, that still have leagues, uh, but they're focused a little bit more for the open plate consumer uh, with the games and the other uh, ancillary products that they provide. But your traditional uh, bowling center in small town America, especially, you know, that's 80 to 90% of their revenue. So if we can't get those guys on the lanes in a timely fashion, and remember in Michigan, we have over 120,000 league bowlers. Uh, we're the largest state in the union with a uh, number of bowling centers, number of league bowlers, uh, and definitely uh, the most uh, number of high school uh, bowlers in, in the country are here in Michigan. And right now, for the last five months, none of them have had an opportunity to participate. So they've been traveling to Ohio, 
Indiana, Illinois, and Wisconsin to get their games in. Um, so they're leaving in groves. And now some of those uh, bowling centers that are closer to the border are losing those league bowlers on a permanent basis because they want to start bowling. And so uh, all we're asking is for the administration to sit down with us, go over our preparedness plan, and if there's some, an issue here, let's, let's start the negotiation. We don't want to go to court, but we feel we have no other alternative. So to this point, I know you said you reached out to the governor's team. Still no response? Have they sat down with anyone in your industry? Zero. Nothing. So that has to be pretty frustrating. If this, How much longer do you think some of these bowling alleys can actually hang on? Um, some of them that are uh, been hanging on for a while, they're, they're going to be gone in the next two weeks um, with no idea that we can start come September 1. So the rally yesterday was intended to be a little bit sooner, but we didn't have enough time to prepare and make sure that we had a, a very organized and peaceful uh, rally to explain our, we want to take the politics out of it. Uh, we want to be able to focus on all the things that we can do to provide a safe environment uh, for our customer base and again it's uh it's been bowling's been running successfully in 45 different states just our neighboring states no issues i've been to tournaments in uh, indiana and ohio my son is uh, going to be bowling in indiana this weekend and uh, we're following all the protocols we have our mask on we're keeping social distance we're not high-fiving we're doing air air fives or fist pumps or elbows uh, all those things that are being recommended. And uh, everyone in the other states have been doing a wonderful job. We just haven't even had an opportunity. So the most frustrating part is the fact that how is it that the administration feels comfortable in doing this, not only to our industry, the fitness centers, the movie theaters, without even having a conversation. Bo Gergen with us, the executive director of the Bowling Centers Association of Michigan. And, and Bo, we've seen with, in some instances, even locally in our, in our immediate area here in, in, our, in the town that we operate our flagship stations out of, we've seen some operations such as gyms and earlier on in the pandemic, uh, hair salons that defied the governor's orders because they were down for so long and were about to lose their business and reopened despite the governor's orders. Do you imagine that that's a step that could be taken by some of these bowling alleys and bowling centers in the future if they're approaching the point of no return and need to bring in some business? Absolutely. Uh, I definitely foresee that. And, and I would say in the next 14 days, if we don't get any response, um, from the administration in any way, shape, or form, uh, I expect uh, up to a couple hundred bowling centers opening up on September 1 because what difference if they take their liquor license or uh, food license, they're going to be shut down anyway. And so this is their, because the banks aren't giving us a re the property taxes were paid last week with no income coming in. Uh, SBA loans, they're asking for their money. Um, so all the, the PPP money is gone. Uh, if this next stimulus package, if it ever comes, can help the small businesses, maybe we can last another month or two. Uh, but there, there's been, there hasn't been nearly enough support from the state in keeping us shut down and staying afloat. It's as if, it, it's as if they don't really care. And uh, that's the messaging that we're getting. I had an opportunity two weeks ago to sit in front of a joint select committee at, on the Capitol with a uh, COVID-19 committee overseeing the administration and how they're handling all these different industries. And their biggest concern is the fact that uh, it's widely known that the administration is not communicating with these industries that are still shut down. And that's all they're asking as a committee. It's an oversight committee administration just please communicate with these guys and start a dialogue and i've done i did about seven interviews yesterday and i saw them online and i saw a response from um i'm assuming it was the health department person involved in the administration saying that it's the science and data that's uh providing the information of why we're shut down all i'm asking is what science are you using there's not been one single case a positive case of COVID-19 in any of our bowling centers in Michigan. We haven't been open. What's the data that says that? There, there is, there's no data in any bowling center in the United States where there's been an issue. 
So I don't, just don't understand where they're getting their information and saying that they're using science and data, yet not providing the science and data. That's the most frustrating part. I know a lot of the bowling alleys also have some type of bar or restaurant. Are any of them open for that type of service just to try to get a little bit of income in the doors? Yes, uh, quite a few of them have done that, uh, but I'll, t I'll go even one step further how frustrating that is even for those folks. And it sounds like both of you guys have bowled before, and, and, and if you were to go into their little restaurant area, some are just snack bars, a lot of them just have an open air to the concourse of the bowling center. So with 50% occupancy in their restaurant side, um, they've asked, well, maybe I can utilize some of the tables that are social distancing six foot apart out on my concourse and feed more people to help try to get some more income. And we had the Wayne County Health Departments tell them absolutely not, the bowling center needs to be closed. And we're thinking, nobody's throwing a bowling ball down the lane. Why can't they sit six feet social distancing in an area and eat their food to help dr drive even a little bit more income? So again, the messaging is all over the place. None of it makes sense. Um, and again, uh, we're still confused what it is about rolling a bowling ball down the lane that, that creates the virus to attack everybody. Bo Gergen with us. He is the executive director of the Bowling Centers Association of, Mis of Michigan with us on the Oakland County Megacast. So, Bo, you have the rally at the Capitol yesterday. Uh, you, are you have opened your organization's began a lawsuit process against the state in order to be able to reopen. What is next as we are getting that much closer to that two-week period you, you mentioned earlier about being critical mass for some of these businesses and that September 1st deadline, September 1st beginning of the fall season? We have our proprietors are working hard talking to their uh, state legislators um, and trying to get the right connection of somebody who can get the, the governor's mm -hmm. ear uh, so we're really uh, digging in deep and, and trying to find that connection to where anybody, please talk to us. Uh, let it, let, give us an understanding of what's going on. Uh, and again, I think in 14 days, if we don't hear any response, I, I foresee uh, a large portion of those operators opening up. Now, even if we were to sit down with the administration, and here's our concern, and we come to an agreement of uh, whatever restrictions are in place, um, let's just say it's 50% occupancy. A lot of us can operate at 50% occupancy. 25%, no one can operate at 25% uh, and, and still be able to pay their bills. But let's just say for the sake of argument, we can operate at 50% occupancy. Our challenge still has to be consumer confidence. There's a lot of people out there that are, are, are listening to all this uh, fear mongering in, uh, on mainstream media and they don't want to go to these uh, facilities because they just don't know the uncertainty of what's going on. And so we're going to have a challenge with up to 30, maybe 40 percent of our, our customer base may not feel comfortable, may want to take the year off until there's a vaccine or until next year. And that may not be uh, enough for us to continue to move forward anyway. So this has been very devastating being shut down for five total months without having a, one day of opportunity to open up and start creating some momentum. Uh, so that's still a challenge, but I expect uh, come September 1, if we haven't heard anything, we have to open up and, and let the chips fall where they may. So Bo, one last question here is, if the community wants to support your effort, where can they get some information? Do you have a Facebook page going to kind of direct them to how they can help you? There are some Facebook campaigns that are going Open Michigan, uh, uh, Open Bowling Centers in Michigan Facebook page has uh, already 10,000 likes on it. Uh, we've got a form builder that's out there that goes directly to the uh, governor's uh, email address uh, to support uh, opening our centers. Um, so we're looking for all the support we can get from uh, not only our bowling community, but from our legislators, and we're getting a lot of ground, uh, a lot of support from, from both sides of the aisle, uh, but the governor's not listening to the legislature right now. And so um, as much as they want to support us, uh, we still have to find that key person in, in the uh, administration that, that's a bowler that understands what bowling centers are and just sits down and says, all right, let's take a look at their plan. Yeah, this looks like it's something that could work, or maybe if we change this, anything. Any conversation whatsoever, we'd be 
be much appreciated of that. Bo, anything else for us today before we let you go? I thank you guys for the opportunity to share our message. Um, and, and a lot of TV stations and newspapers have picked this up uh, in the last week, obviously since the lawsuit was put out there. Uh, we're real confident with our, um, our lawyer on uh, what's going on right now. So, um, but, you know, as you stated earlier, no one's won yet against the governor. She's got some amazing powers uh, with, with her authority. So uh, that's a very uphill challenge, um, but uh, we're gonna keep fighting our, our fight. Uh, the Bowling community is an amazing community. It's like an extended family. So if either of you have never bowled in a league, that's one thing that you want to do is go down to your local bowling center during a league night and you'll see that people sign up for 33 weeks of the season and so you get to see these people once a week for 30 34 weeks and you get to know who their kids are and what they do for a living and the networking opportunities and so forth so um that's what's amazing about um the bowling scenario is the extended family well bob we thank you very much for being with us today Thank you. Appreciate it. Bo Gergen, the executive director of the Bowling Centers Association of Michigan, with us on the Oakland County Megacast is bowling, uh, bowling centers and bowling alleys. One of those last few business sectors, uh, much like some personal services like gyms, that remain closed and not able to operate during the COVID-19 pandemic. They've been out for five months. They're getting fed up. They have, they have tried to open communication with the governor's office and are not getting a satisfactory response as to why they can't open, why their plans are not feasible. And we've seen in the past such, a, uh, such organizations uh, that have formed like the salons and, and, and hair organizations that sent similar plans to the governor and the governor initially denied those and turned them away, but eventually did end up reopening those industries with similar subject matter in the planning. Maybe the case could be made for these bowling alleys as well as they as they do regularly clean all those materials and, and from what Bo was saying, have a plan in place to regularly clean all community materials, maintain social distance in those la large facilities, and are at a point where if they don't reopen in two weeks, people are going to lose their jobs and people are going to lose their businesses. Yeah, we'll see them. Some are going to roll the dice and say, hey, let me try to open even if it's against the order and see if I get shut down because I'm going to lose my business anyway. Got to try something. But the other point he made is they are going to nearby states and still bowling, but they're doing it in Ohio. They're doing it in Indiana. We saw that in the beginning with the hair salons where Ohio opened up earlier. People were going across state lines to get these services that they were unable to get in this state. And at the end of the day, it's our own local communities and businesses that are hurting and not getting that revenue. And a lot of people got the small business loans, but now they're due and you haven't even been able to reopen to try to recoup some of that money. They're going to have to relook at that and extend some of those payments. And we certainly don't condone breaking the laws that are in place or defying the governor's orders. We are very much in support of maintaining the public safety during COVID-19 and a lot and a lot of those actions are being have been taken by the governor's office in order to maintain that public safety but we've seen it before with some gyms even in the local area recently that have come into the news we've even reported on it remaining open or d despite county the county messages local messages or the orders of the governor incurring those fines and and taking the risk of losing their license simply in order to keep the doors open so they can keep paying their employees and making some sort of money to be able to pay their bills as well. It's a really tough and complicated situation that's going to need a lot of compromise and creative problem solving going forward. Well, we've seen a lot of businesses be able to pivot and get very creative and trying to maybe offer things virtually or some gyms are still doing classes out in parking lots. But when you're talking about bowling, that's a little bit harder because we can't bowl outside in the parking lot. It's a very, and it is a sport. I, pe yes. I think people forget that bowling is a sport. And um, because, it, you know, for people like you and I that are just casual bowlers, you go once in a while, it is a skill. Um, you see oh, it, yeah. you know, bowling on ESPN. So it is a sport. 
but you need that practice facility. And they're not the only ones. I know gymnastics is having a hard yes. time during this time as well. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated situation. And for those that are still out of work and out of business because of those shutdowns, it gets more, it, it's understandably getting increasingly more frustrating as we're now five plus months into the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, we're going to take a quick break. It is the top of the hour. We'll continue on with more great guests coming up in just a little bit. You're watching and listening to the Oakland County Megacast on Comcast Channel 15 and AT&T Channel 99 on Birmingham Area Municipal Access in Birmingham, Bingham Farms, Beverly Hills in the village of Franklin and in West Bloomfield Township in the cities of Sylvan Lake, Orchard Lake and Kego Harbor. In addition today, as always, on 89.3 WBL the Orchard Lake, West Bloomfield, Kego Harbor, Sylvan Lake, and on 88.1 WBFH, Bloomfield Hills. We're also today on the Facebook page of the West Bloomfield Township Fire Department, and thank Chief Flynn and their entire team for joining us. The Megacast continues with our second hour of the show today after these quick messages. Michigan, we're calling on you to save lives. Don't ignore it. Don't let it go to voicemail. It's urgent. In fact, it's critical. Because if you've been in close contact with someone who tests positive for COVID-19, you may have been exposed to the virus. And you could get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department. So please answer the call to learn how to protect yourself, your family, and friends. We're calling on you to stop the spread of COVID-19, to make it safe to reopen businesses and help Michigan move forward. So if you get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department, you may have been exposed to someone with COVID-19. To protect us all, answer the call. Learn more at michigan.gov slash contain COVID. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Hi, my name is Kurt Lawson and I'm the Public Information Officer for West Bloomfield Township. We wanted to reach out to you, our older adults, to provide information that you may find useful during this difficult time. We want to ensure you that West Bloomfield Town Hall, our Waters and Utility Department, West Bloomfield Parks, and our Police and Fire Departments continue to work hard on your behalf. Information and resources can be found on the Township website, the Police Facebook and Twitter, or call West Bloomfield Parks COVID-19 Help Hotline. Please remember to keep your social distance of at least six feet, wear facial coverings when you leave your home, and wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap. These precautions will help keep you safe during these difficult times. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe alongside Ronnie Dahl in the studios of Civic Center TV and 89.3. Lakes FM, our flagship TV and radio stations on the network of community television, radio, and other media outlets that make up the Oakland County Megacast each and every day. It's not just a radio broadcast, not just a TV broadcast, not your regular simulcast. It's a little bit of everything encompassed into a multitude of community television, radio, and other media outlets bringing you the most important news about COVID-19 and other top stories in the local area Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 12 noon live on our flagship stations as well as 88.1 WBFH, The Biff, and, and Birmingham Area Municipal Access. Today, we're also pleased to be joined via Facebook Live by the West Bloomfield Township Fire Department. We thank Chief Flynn and their entire team over at the West Bloomfield Fire Department for joining us today and uh, hope that you will join us tomorrow and onward Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 12 noon on the Oakland County Megacast as we continue to talk to a number of guests about a multitude of interesting and important topics related to COVID-19 and regular life as it's impacted by the virus and the after effects of COVID-19. And, and joining us now to kick off the second hour of our program today, we're pleased to be joined by Kevin Cronin. He is a principal over at the at for Terrace Capital Advisors. Kevin, thank you for being with us today. Hi, good morning, and thank you for having me. Appreciate having you on. How are you? How's your team over at Fort Terrace Capital Advisors doing? We are doing great. We are uh, navigating these uh, COVID waters, and we're helping clients get through it. So, yeah, let's let's touch a little bit on that. It's a tough time, especially for business owners and a lot, and for a lot of their employees as well as they are off of work. What is your team working on, or have been focusing on, with your clients to keep them in as best financial standing as they possibly can be, despite the treacherous financial times caused by COVID nineteen? 
Yeah, thank you. So for Terrace Capital Advisors, we're a full service risk management and financial advisory firm. We focus on, when I say risk management, that's anything that um, affects revenue or potentially affects revenue. So what we're working with our clients on is threat and risk assessments. How do you reopen after COVID-19? What threats and what risks does each company face? And to each company, it's unique. We come in and we'll work with our clients to put together a plan. First, we identify those pitfalls of the company, and then we put together a plan to help them navigate these waters. And every industry, every profession is a little bit different. Um, so we recommend starting off with a uh, very robust um, threat and risk assessment, and then we look at putting together crisis management plans. And on those crisis management plans, we look at everything from not just finances, but we look at security and uh, any potential risks to operations or supply chain, anything that would affect uh, the employees or the customers of the company. Uh, we recommend right now, most people are working from home. So we highly encourage everybody to review their cybersecurity platform. What uh, policies do they have in place to ensure that their data, the customer's data, and the employee's data is all protected. Um, we also uh, want to look at your, if you're part of the PPP uh, program, make sure you're compliant with all of those. Uh, just to make sure you stay compliant with the company and with the government on those loans. So you also mentioned about security. I would imagine as more and more employees are working at home, for those businesses that have a brick and mortar location, are you finding that there are more break-ins or that their building is vulnerable to theft as well? Absolutely, and this really goes back to the civil unrest that we're seeing across the country right now. Uh, we have a lot of clients that are, you know, they own brick and mortar or they're leasing brick and mortar locations, but they don't have employees in there per se. Uh, you see a lot of looting, uh, vandalism, and stuff like that going on around the country. With those, uh, there's steps to put in place to safeguard your property um, there. So, when I talk about a security and risk of threat set, uh, excuse me, a security risk and threat assessment, we're talking about the security of the company. If they're working here in the United States, but they have offices abroad, are they? Uh, are those? protected over there? Do they have good intelligence of what's actually happening on the ground? Do they have good intelligence of what's happening in each region where they're located? Kevin Cronin with us. He is the he's the principal over at Fort Harris Capital Advisors with us on the Oakland County Megacast. So for individuals, what should they be looking at right now as we're five months into the pandemic? It seems like it's going to continue on through the remainder of the year, maybe even early on into 2021 financially and from a security standpoint also what should individuals maybe that aren't business owners that are just regular people like ronnie and i what should we be looking out for financially as we're heading into even more unknown going forward well the big thing you have to do is you have to plan uh with your expectations to align with reality right so i would recommend a conservative approach um on investing and spending money. And when you look at your expenses, I look at it two ways. You have an expense and then you have an investment. Um, expenses are controlled or hopefully controlled and investments are something that are gonna pay off dividends in the future. Um, right now, even on a, on a personal basis, when you're looking at your finances, I would recommend being more conservative on what you're spending right now. Uh, protect your cash on hand we don't know how long this is going to take. This could end November 4th. This may go on for another year until after the vaccine. I believe it's going to be somewhere in between there. Um, but a conservative approach moving forward is, I think, the right steps to go. Along those lines, I would also have a contingency plan in place to where if something happens, we can quickly pivot in one direction or another to answer those pitfalls that we may find ourselves in. Kevin Cronin with us. He is the principal over at Forteris Capital Advisors with us on the Oakland County Megacast. So in your industry, 
how have things changed over the course of the pandemic? Everything's been modified and people have had to pivot and people have had to make changes to how they operate. I'm sure that's still also the case in terms of financial advisors and capital advisors, such as your team up at Forteris. Absolutely. You know, the, the COVID-19 has given us a lot of challenges, but it's also provided a lot of opportunities. And the key is to identify those opportunities and to capitalize on them. Uh, business today is different than it was a year ago, different than it was back in January or February of 2020. Um, you know, more people are working remote. There's a lot of unemployment. People are out of the jobs that they were holding, you know, comfortable C-suite jobs all the way down to your um, small mom and pop businesses. And so with those uh, positions being eliminated, it does create opportunity to pivot in a new direction, a new career path. Uh, you know, I have friends and colleagues that have been affected by unemployment and they've, they've pivoted into a completely different career path and they're, they're happy. And I think working at home, it, it's either really good for you or it's really bad for you. And I think that depends on your personality and what you're, what you're used to and what your home situation is and if you're set up to have a remote work office and the type of work you do. If you're in the service section or service industry, you know, that's hard. You can't necessarily work from home on your previous guest that runs the bowling alleys. Um, you can't bowl in a parking lot or from your home. You have to go to one of those facilities to do that. Uh, so those are challenges, obviously. Uh, but what we'd like to do is help our clients find opportunities and make uh, lemonade out of lemons. So I think that's uh, a good um, good advice for everyone. What do you think, from your standpoint, is going to be the long-term impact of this pandemic for a majority of your clients? You know, right now, revenue is going to be down pretty much across the board in every industry for 2020. Um, hopefully, uh, you had good pre-planning in the beginning of uh, you know the previous years, and you have ca cash on hand, and hopefully you have contingency plans to where you can survive opening up at 50% or 30%. Um, but 2020 is going to be a challenging year. We're going to see a lot of businesses go out of, out of out of business because they don't have the cash on hand, and they're not able to continue to uh, make their expenses. Going forward, you'll also see new businesses and people finding those opportunities and capitalizing on those. So uh, I'm hoping 2021 turns out to be a much better year for all of us than 2020. There's going to be challenges that are going to last through the years. Uh, and they may last five or 10 years to recover from. A lot of businesses are scaling back there. You know, you, every day you're reading in the Wall Street Journal that, you know, uh, somebody just cut another 250 employees for every 200 for every 250 employees that are cuts, that goes back to families. It goes back to paying for their sports, their kids' sports and their kids' tuition and and what they would consider their normal lifestyle drastically changes. Kevin, for those who are now five months into the pandemic, maybe they've continued to work on and off or are now back full time with industries reopening or, or maybe that's it's somebody that has been out of work and been on unemployment and that's about and has lost that extra federal benefit and they're starting their process of planning and risk manage and risk managing their funds now what are the first f several steps that they should be taking in that process to put their best foot forward and get the ball rolling albeit better late than never so right now if you have debt i would check with your creditors and there's programs in place to help people through the covid uh, pandemic, you know, banks, car loans, mortgages, they're deferring a lot of those payments. So the first thing I would say is have a budget and know exactly what your, um, what your budget is and be able to account for every dollar that's coming in and out. Um, and what I would suggest is talking to your creditors, if you're maintaining it, you know, debt and see if you can get uh, a relief on that debt. And there's companies out there that can, that can help individuals do that. Um, that's the first step. And then the second step, I would say, is to make sure that you have uh, a plan going forward, right? And attack that plan every day with enthusiasm uh, and urgency. 
to try to execute that plan, especially when people are moving into a new market or moving into a new career path, right? It's, it may, it's, it's gonna push people out of their comfort zone, but that's okay. Um, a lot of times when people get pushed out of their comfort zone, it's because there's something better down the line waiting for them anyhow. They may not realize it at the time and that stresses everybody out. Stress is from work and stress is from losing money or income doesn't just affect the individual, it affects the entire family. So Kevin, I'm looking at your LinkedIn page, you have a very diverse background. One of the things, you're an expert and you help company in investigations of like loss prevention, trade secrets, data, intellectual property and product distribution, as well as fraud. When we're in the middle of a pandemic, people tend to lose focus. So do you anticipate we're going to see more of these issues come up for these companies because they're so busy focusing on the crisis of COVID-19 that it makes them more vulnerable to fraud and some of these other security issues? 100%. Absolutely. The Gartner report just came out and it showed that just during the COVID-19, frauds increased 200%. I mean, think of that, 200%. And then what I would ask a company is, do they know what their total cost of fraud is? And when I say total cost of fraud, it's not just how many dollars you lost in a fraudulent deal or transaction or theft, internal or external. It's more of what's the total cost of fraud. And what we'll calculate in that number is your amount of labor hours. What did it cost you in time? What did it cost you in attorney's fees? what's the total cost and it usually comes out to be about two dollars and thirty cents to every dollar that you've lost so the total cost of fraud is much more than what the actual uh dollar amount is on the books kevin just another couple minutes with you any uh, lasting advice for people that are tuning in now for businesses for business owners that are tuning in now that are trying to put their best foot forward and battle through the remainder of this pandemic no matter how long it may go on yeah, I would say focus on the top line, right? And make sure that you to have a strong bottom line, you gotta focus on the top line. You look at what your expenses are and then you manage that against your, um, you know, what, what you consider an expense and what you consider an investment. Right now, if you're gonna open during COVID-19 or get back to work during COVID-19, highly recommend a robust threat and risk assessment. With that would be a contingency plans to put into place due diligence. Make sure you know if you're hiring new people, make sure you know who the people are. Do a deep dive background checks. Uh, and that depends on what uh, position that they're applying for. But I would do a background check on everybody. And I would look at, you know, not just their professional, but look at their personal life, their social media. Make sure that their values align with your values of your company. Um, and then just make sure you reevaluate your cybersecurity policy and make sure you have one in place. Make sure everyone that's working remote, and if they're logging in, make sure that they're doing that according to your guidelines. Well, Kevin, we thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you very much. Appreciate the time. Appreciate having you. Kevin Cronin, Principal at Forteris Capital Investments with us, uh, Capital Advisors, my apologies, Forteris Capital Advisors with us on the Oakland County Megacast. We're going to take a quick break. We'll come back. We'll review today's top headlines, and then we'll speak with audiologist Nina Lopatin. That coming up after this break. You're watching and listening to the Oakland County Megacast on our family of TV and radio stations. Ronnie and I will return after this break. This may seem uncomfortable. But so is being hooked to an IV, sleeping in a hospital bed, and fighting for your life. When it comes to COVID-19, comfort is not as important as saving lives. Wearing a mask can greatly reduce the chance of spreading the virus. So mask up, Michigan, every time you leave home. As rivals, we don't always see eye to eye. Like who scored the best recruits? Who's going to be who? And whether we wear green or blue. But one thing we can all agree on to help stop the spread of COVID-19. Wear a mask. 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 The ball's in your court, Michigan.
Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe, joined by Ronnie Dahl in the studios of Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM for our community television and radio network of stations on TV, radio, and the internet, including 88.1 WBFH, The Biff, joining us today as always, and Birmingham Area Municipal Access in Birmingham, Bingham Farms, Beverly Hills, and the Village of Franklin. That makes up our family of stations across the Oakland County area as we continue to bring you the latest news and information about COVID-19 and other top stories in the local area each and every day. Our live shows, of course, 10 a.m. to 12 noon, Monday through Friday, but you can watch us for replays throughout the afternoons and the evenings and over the weekends on Civic Center TV on Comcast Channel 15, AT&T Channel 99, and online in high definition on CivicCenterTV.com as well as on demand on CivicCenterTV.com, which is also at a coronavirus link on the top of that page, the home for the latest news and information in our local area regarding COVID-19, including our top story today, fall favorite cider mill is going to stay closed. A Michigan cider mill will not open this fall because of the pandemic. P Plymouth Orchards and Cider Mill won't open be because the COVID-19 pandemic has presented too many public health obstacles for us to operate safely, according to a posting on its Facebook page. It continued on, we believe that opening this year would be risky for our cider mill team and our cider mill guests, and closed quote. The mill said it made the decision, quote, with a heavy heart and that it is the first time the mill will have closed its doors in more than 35 years since it has been open. On Wednesday, Michigan recorded nine deaths and 517 cases of the novel coronavirus. The state's overall tally now has reached 89,271 cases and 6,273 deaths, according to the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. So a fall staple has fallen, Ronnie. Uh, Plymouth Orchards and Cider Mill will not be open. I'm sure other cider mills and other places like it will 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 act will enact the similar fate for themselves going into the fall as COVID-19 continues to take a toll on industries throughout the state of Michigan and the country. I was so disappointed when I saw this. You understand why they made the decision that they did because for any business that has an outbreak that is traced back to them it can be devastating. So you understand why businesses are making these decisions but from a personal standpoint, that is one of my favorite things to do in the fall time. It's not fall until you go to the cider mill because you may be able to pick the donuts up at you know the local grocery store or even the cider, but it never, never is near as good as when it comes directly from the cider mill. Yeah, unfortunately for fans of Plymouth, of, of Plymouth Orchard and Cider Mill, that will not be open in the fall. Uh, no indication of other similar cider mills closing just yet, but uh, it would look like that's probably going to be the case very soon. Other news on civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. Beaumont Health tightens visitor hours. Beaumont Health announced it will no longer allow visitors to Farmington Hills as hospital because of a rise in novel coronavirus cases on the campus. A quote from Mark Geary, their spokesperson, over the past few days, we have had multiple staff, patients, and visitors test positive for COVID-19. That's why out of an abundance of caution, we are temporarily restricting visitors at our Farmington Hills campus, and closed quote. It started this morning at 8 a.m. No visitors will be allowed in the rooms of patients who have COVID-19 or those who are awaiting test results, except in an end-of-life scenario or other extreme circumstances. So one local hospital taking extreme caution after a, a small outbreak at the facility in Farmington Hills. Uh, no indication that other Beaumont Health facilities are going to have similar rules in place anytime soon. This appears to be an isolated incident, but the Farmington Hills campus of Beaumont Health taking extreme precaution with a minor outbreak of COVID-19. Which is important to note that they are taking all the precautions and other hospitals have not changed anything because while healthcare workers and hospitals have been extremely busy during this pandemic, they've also taken a huge financial hit because where they make so much of their bottom line is from other services, not emergency services connected to COVID-19. So we wanna let other people know that regular hospitals are still open. This is just this one hospital, this one location as of right now. 
Find more information on that story and more, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. Get more details on Beaumont Health uh, closing its Farmington Hills campus to visitors due to COVID-19 or restricting visitation uh, to those who uh, who may be visiting patients with COVID-19 or who are being tested and have not received results from their COVID-19 tests. Lastly, on civicsoundertv.com slash coronavirus, a push to revamp Michigan's deposit law, bottle deposit law. Michigan's 10-cent deposit law on beer, pop, and other bottles and cans enacted in 1976 has been widely successful in getting these receptacles recycled, but those involved in making, distributing, and collecting those bottles and cans say the law needs revamping. Organizations including the Michigan Beer and Wine Wholesalers Association want a greater portion of the revenues from unredeemed bottle and can deposits to go to recycling programs, beverage distributors, and police to help stop deposit fraud. But the Department of Environment, Great Lakes, and Energy, or EGLE, officials say that doing so would take already insufficient funding away from programs to clean up contaminated sites statewide. Total refunds in Michigan have ranged from $346 million to $425 million per year since 2000, according to the Michigan Department of Treasury. More than $80 million in bottles and cans accumulated unreturned in people's closets and garages during the COVID-19 stoppage, and some of those returnables were likely discarded in the trash as people ran out of room, industry representatives have said. So the uh, bottle return industry is looking to increase funding for the industry so they can continue to production, make more of a profit, make it more worth their while, especially when they're getting an influx of these bottle cans and other accepted materials after they were put into people's storage for so long during the early portions of the pandemic. Michigan has one of the highest deposit returns at the dime. We have seen other states have it. Typically, it's a nickel or maybe a few pennies. So they're simply saying, hey, can we have a larger piece of the pie that that money is generating because we want to make upgrades into the industry? I will say to uh, Tyler, people don't think much about that dime deposit but the fraud involved in the bottle and can deposit can be very, very high. So I did a story once years ago, and these businesses were taking these cans from Ohio and bringing them over here for the deposit. It was millions of dollars. So you think of that dime as just one little dime, but it was millions of dollars involved in this fraud and it was a, a, a big investigation, a police investigation. It takes a lot of resources. So they're saying, hey, we want a little bit more of this deposit money so that we can, number one, address the fraud because it's the taxpayers. When we pay that dime deposit, we're losing out on that money when they, you know, they do the fraud because they're getting our tax dollars. But also, we need to make some upgrades because if you've tried to return your bottles and cans during this pandemic or even since it's it's been allowed for you to be able to return them, it's not so easy. You're only you're being limited. You have to go back multiple times. A lot of places still aren't taking them to this day. Yeah, it's a difficult situation, and it's definitely tough for people who have been hoarding those cans all throughout the pandemic, hoping that eventually things would reopen and they'd be able to return them all in one fell swoop. That's not the case. And then the fraud issue is very serious and not something that's really uh, been discussed heavily in regards to bottle returns. It's not just you know, it's not just Kramer and Newman driving in right. Newman's mail truck from New York to return things. These are serious situation. So more information on that story, you can click and view the entire article by going to civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. In addition, you can find reputable resources about COVID-19 as the information is ever changing. From the federal level at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's COVID-19 page, the state page, uh, by clicking on State of Michigan, it'll give you information about the My Safe Return to Schools roadmap and the My Safe Start Plan, Michigan Safe Start Plan. As well as a link to Oakland County there, if you click on that, it'll take you to Oakland County's direct COVID-19 website, webpage, and it'll give information you can, that you can text to get more information on COVID-19, an email to reach the Nurse on Call hotline, and a phone number to re reach the Nurse on Call hotline to set up an appointment for drive through testing of COVID-19 if you believe that you need to get tested. Then more, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus, your home for the latest news and information on COVID-19 in the Oakland County area. We'll take another quick break. When we come back, we'll speak with audiologist Nina Lopayton on the Oakland County Megacast. We thank you for tuning in. Ronnie and I will return after this 
quick break. Michigan, the coronavirus pandemic has put us all to the test. And now it's time to put COVID-19 to the test. As we move forward, testing will be critical. We encourage anyone who has reason to get tested to do so. Those with symptoms and those without. If you are leaving home and going back to work, get tested. If you think you may have COVID-19 or you've been exposed recently through family, friends, or coworkers, get tested. Our test locator tool can help you find the right testing site that fits your needs. Even if you're looking for easy access with no cost, no prescription, and no appointment necessary, we've got you covered. Help Michigan move forward, not backward. To find a testing site or learn more, visit michigan.gov slash coronavirus test. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Michigan, we still need to stay careful because we don't want to go backwards, back to where we started. So keep standing six feet apart, keep wearing a mask in public, and if you have symptoms, talk to a healthcare provider about getting tested. To move forward, let's all do our part. So stay careful, michigan.gov slash coronavirus. Welcome back. I'm Tyler Keefe alongside Ronnie Dahl. You're watching and listening to the Oakland County Megacast on our family of TV, radio, and other media outlets. On television, Civic Center TV and Birmingham Area Municipal Access, both of those channels. Comcast 15 and AT&T Channel 99 under the Public Access Government and Education Channels Guide. In addition, today is always 89.3 Lakes FM and live streaming online on lakesfm.com. 88.1 WBFH, The Biff, and their live stream on WBFH.FM. And today, our Facebook partner is the West Bloomfield Township Fire Department, West Bloomfield Fire Department. Joining us today via Facebook Live, we appreciate Chief Greg Flynn for being on with us and his entire team for allowing us to broadcast today's show on their Facebook page. For those of you just tuning in, you can watch and listen to our show each and every day during the work week, Monday through Friday, live from 10 a.m. to 12 noon. In addition, we are on in the afternoons on Civic Center TV and Lakes FM for replays throughout the afternoons, evenings, and over the weekends. And you can find us on demand on civiccentertv.com. Just click on our Megacast link again at civiccentertv.com. You'll find full episodes, short clips, and interviews from each and every edition of the Oakland County Megacast, including today's episode, where we're pleased to be joined by our last guest today, Nina Lopatin. She is an audiologist with direct hearing with us on the Oakland County Megacast. Nina, thank you for being with us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Appreciate having you on. How are you? How's your team over at Direct Hearing? I am the team, Tyler. <laughs> My team is great. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, we are glad to hear that. So over the course of the pandemic, um, how, ha how has business been? Are you still seeing a regular number of patients coming in? Has that been reduced? and Or maybe has that been reduced and now it's flowing back in slowly but surely? Oh, flowing back in, surely, truly. Um, during the pandemic, I was able to help my patients by doing curbside audiology. Um, I really strongly feel that uh, hearing is an essential service because staying connected is so vital, especially now for seniors and people with hearing loss who are feeling so incredibly isolated. So during the pandemic, I did help people. I would go car side with my mask and my gloves, pick their hearing aids up, they come up to my office, clean and check them, make sure they're working well and take them back to them. Uh, since mm, beginning of July, uh, I'm currently saying, seeing patients in my office uh, and I am doing a lot of COVID-19 protocols to make sure that they are safe. So Nina, during this pandemic, you talked a little bit about the isolation, but how has this been for your patients with everyone having to wear a mask? Does that increase their feeling of isolation? Um, I don't think that that increases their feeling of isolation, Ronnie. It's more the uh, difficulty understanding what people are saying, honestly. Uh, the isolation, um, is not referenced to necessarily wearing a mask, but they are struggling more 
because the masks reduce the loudness of the person speaking they're speaking with and they're not able to le read lips. I've gone to the extent of ordering oh, three or four different varieties of masks with clear mouths just so my patients can see them um, and they are helpful and I believe that patients appreciate them. Nina Lil Payton with us. She is an audiologist at Direct Hearing with us on the Oakland County Megacast. So when I, when I think of an audiologist, and when many people maybe think of an audiologist, they think about it on a very basic level. They're thinking about when you go in for a hearing test for school or for, for, for a job or whatever the case may be. But there's so much more that goes into audiology and that practice that's really helpful for people. Can you explain a little bit for those that have a novice's point of view, just what, what audiologists do provide to their patients? Um, myself at Direct Hearing, what I provide are comprehensive hearing evaluations at no charge. Um, I can give you the perspective from my practice and then go into the profession as a whole. Um, if next steps to better hearing uh, include trying hearing aids, I provide a two week hearing aid test drive, which is risk free and commitment free. I also am able to do hearing aid repairs and modifications with my on site lab. I do ear mold impressions for custom hearing protection products, including noise, swim, hunting and musician earplugs. Um, uh, the profession as a whole is so much more vast than people realize. As you mentioned, Tyler, uh, audiologists do balance testing and vestibular testing. Um, besides hearing aids, we work in um, operating rooms, monitoring evoke potentials during surgeries, uh, neonatal intensive care, screening of infants. Every newborn is now screened. Um, for hearing loss, which needs to be followed up. So as you said, the field of audiology is so much more vast than people do realize. And people don't realize either just how much impact that their hearing and that their and that the health of their of their hearing has on the rest of their body. You mentioned that uh, audiologists do a lot of work with balance. How it does mm -hmm. how is the body affected by hearing ail ailments or by injuries to the to the hearing systems? Uh, well, uh, hearing is broken down to, into a couple of parts, hearing and understanding. So which kind of makes sense? When we do test hearing, uh, we test different frequencies across a range and or across loudness, but then we also uh, test understanding ability, which is separate. Just because you hear someone talk doesn't mean you understood what they said. And typically as hearing decreases, the ability to understand speech also decreases because you're not hearing those sounds as well. Um, so that's hearing and understanding. Please remind me of the rest of your question. Oh, uh, what are other ways that your hearing can have impact on the rest of your, of your body's health? Well, um, your balance system you were uh, referring to, your balance system is in your inner ear. Um, they are separate nerves to the brain, um, but um, well, hearing, when your hearing decreases, your other senses also need to be more intense. So older people who have decreased hearing and also have decreased vision, it's a matter of psychologically isolation, to be honest with you. Um, when you talk about overall well-being, I think that that's important to note that um, when you're not hearing and contributing uh, to conversations and interactions, especially people with dementia, um, uh, it's so important for them to be connected so they can be part of the conversation and feel connected to the, connected to the world. So a lot of schools are getting ready to go back to uh, class in the fall, but they're still doing remote learning. How has this impacted our kids that have to learn virtually? Have you seen patients that our kids come in that are having a hard time keeping up because they're not in the classroom setting? I'm sorry, I cannot address that, Ronnie, because m most of my population, I would say, is 40 plus, and I'm not involved with the school age population. Well, I want to. Well, talk to my expertise. 
Well, well thank you for that for that clarification, Nina. So uh, on that topic, though, with people are with people that are working virtually and they are at home, they're engaging mm -hmm. more with technology, which means they're much like I'm doing here and, and Ronnie's doing here. We're wearing headphones, or we're wearing earbuds, and we're adjusting right. volume controls on all of these devices all throughout the day sometimes and just get sure. constant stimulus through the years. Have you noticed that that's had an impact on people's hearing health over the course of this pandemic? Um, I, uh, I cannot uh, tell you the specific research articles, white papers or whatever, regarding hearing loss, uh, noise-induced hearing loss due to the use of earbuds and headphones, um, it, it only makes sense that if you expose yourself to loud music, loud sounds for long periods of time, you are going to affect your hearing, bottom line. Um, Noise-induced hearing loss we see a lot in, in regards to hunting and shooting and work in factories. I see a lot of peers who have gone to a lot of concerts having noise-induced hearing loss. So yes, with the earbuds and the headphones and things like that, there is a greater chance of noise-induced hearing loss. Uh, what you mentioned, Tyler, in terms of connectivity, one benefit of hearing aids is the technology has allowed us to connect hearing aids to cell phones. And the reason that that is vital uh, is that the patient can actually hear the phone conversation, not by holding the phone up to their ear, but through their hearing aids. And being able to hear the phone through their hearing aids, especially both ears, really improves their understanding ability and their ability to connect with their loved ones. Can you talk a little bit about some of the newer technology and how it's helping in your industry? Sure, absolutely. Um, so you understand about hearing aids. Hearing aids are programmed to a patient's hearing loss. They are incredibly complex computers. And uh, think about what the goal of wearing a hearing aid is. It's to help you focus and to hear and understand speech in very difficult or challenging listening environments. What are those? That's when you're, uh, it's not necessarily one-to-one -one with a person sitting across from you at a desk. It's when you're in that business meeting. Um, it's when you're traveling in the car with two kids in the back seat and the person in the passenger seat is trying to tell you where to go and how to get there. Um, it's in a crowded restaurant with a table of six and trying to follow the conversations around the table. Uh, so the technology that is available is very sophisticated. It's also very natural sounding and the levels of technology have so many automatic adjustments that the hearing instruments do when you change these environments, like walking from a perhaps a quiet car to an outdoor gathering, they um, smoothly change how they amplify speech and sound based on your environment. If, if it's quiet all around, like in the car, and then you're in a, an outdoor gathering with uh, sounds coming and speech coming from all different directions. Nina Lopayton with us. She is an audiologist at Direct Hearing with us on the Oakland County Megacast across the local area on our family of TV, radio, and other media outlets. So circling back to technology's impact on people's hearing health, especially uh, during the pandemic when they're engaging with more technology. Maybe people are home longer for longer periods of time, so they're listening to more music. Musicians maybe are playing more music and so on and so forth. That can also take a toll on people's uh, hearing he hearing health over time and there's things that people do in regular times as well that often are detrimental to their hearing what are some tips that you have or some advice that you have for people to maintain their, the health of their hearing and and prevent hearing loss well the first thing i would say is get a baseline hearing test so you know where you're hearing at this time at this point in time um, the reason a baseline hearing evaluation is so important is because you don't know what you're missing. Okay, so when you know where your hearing stands at this point in time, that's a good start. Only makes sense, Tyler, that you uh, listen to your headphones, your earbuds at not quiet, but normal listening levels. Normal is different for everybody. 
Um, you try to take it down a few notches just so you can understand comfortably. Um, hearing health, what else about hearing health? Um, nothing sharper than your elbow in your ears. Please do not use Q-tips to clean your ears because all that does is make uh, my life and other people's lives more difficult trying to get it out. So uh, be kind to your ears and your ear canals and nothing sharper than your elbow in your ear and tune it down, be reasonable. So uh, Nina, is there a certain age that you recommend people get a hearing test? Because a lot of adults haven't had them since they were probably kids. Yeah, um, uh, if you suspect you are having an issue hearing and understanding, you probably are. Um, the other issue is on an age per se, 40, 45, if you're struggling, on average, uh, Ronnie, it takes seven years for a person with hearing loss to come in for testing. And that's usually because family and friends are, you know, egging them on and saying, you're having difficulty hearing and understanding. Well, if your family's talking, you know, talking to you and suggesting that there might be an issue because you're constantly seeing, constantly saying what, that's a good time. You don't need an age. Um, you need feedback from your family and know that you are asking people to repeat, you're turning up the TV louder than other people, you have ringing and buzzing sounds in your ears, which is called tinnitus, or as we talked about before, you're feeling stressed and tired from working so hard to hear and understand. Those are all signs of hearing loss, which you can use to make a good choice to come in. So aside from what you do, you did mention that you were a team of one. How, as a business owner, have you managed to survive and what were some of the biggest struggles for you to make it through? Um, I am very blessed and very fortunate to have my practice within my husband's CPA office. So we share expenses in that way. I have an incredible patient base who are fabulous at supporting me by referring friends and family, which is the greatest compliment and I'm very grateful for that. Um, I am catching up or I am caught up from the people who have come in. Uh, so I think I'm in a really good place in terms of the pandemic. It, it gave me a chance to learn uh, techniques for infection control and uh, client and patient safety and safety for me. So um, I think that we have weathered the storm well. And I like the fact that even post opening up, after opening up, I'm going to continue to do car side or curbside audiology. And I think that that's a real positive too, Ronnie. Well, that's really great to hear Nina Lopet, an audiologist with direct hearing that you've made those pivots, you've been able to survive through this pandemic and that your patients are doing a great job in supporting you Thank and you. supporting their health as well. So just another couple yes. of minutes with you before we let you go. And I, and I uh, it caught my it caught my ear earlier on in the interview, <laughs> no pun intended, okay, maybe a little yeah. bit intended, uh, when you said nothing sharper than your elbow when you're, uh, put, when you're putting something in your ear to clean your ear. In that situation, right. what should people do, what can people do to clean their ears out safely and help their hearing without being a detriment to you, of course, and your services, and of course, to be to their own ear canal health. Well, ideally, your ears are supposed to be self-cleaning. So in other words, any wax that you produce is supposed to move itself out gradually. Um, <clears throat> uh, you really, before you do any treatment, you need to make sure that your ear canals are healthy and that your ear your eardrums are intact. So I'm not gonna recommend anybody put anything in their ear until that they know that, that that's the case. Um, uh, people who have ventured into their ear canals realize that they are incredibly sensitive. So if you scratch your ear canal with a Q-tip or anything like that, you're, you're gonna really be uncomfortable. So Tyler, I would give an approach to cleaning your ear canals, yet I hesitate based on people needing to know that their um, eardrums are intact and it wouldn't affect anything else. So I'm gonna err on the side of caution. 
That's always a good idea to err on the side of caution. Nina LaPayton, just another minute or so with you. Anything else that you that you think is important for our audience to know, for people to know about their ear health or any other information you'd like to touch on today? Well, um, as I said, a baseline hearing evaluation is so important at any time in your life um, because you don't know what you're missing. And uh, we talked about the signs of hearing loss. If you have any question at all, what harm is there in coming in? I do not charge for it because I feel so passionately that people know, need to know where their, their hearing, hearing stands at this point. And um, listeners need to know and understand that hearing is so important in keeping them connected with their friends and family which leads to better warm and fuzzy feelings and, and positive outlooks on life. Well, Nina, we appreciate having you on the show with us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being with us. Nina Lopayton, audiologist at Direct Hearing, a team of one and doing a great job over at Direct Hearing. We appreciate having her on with us on the Oakland County Megacast and hearing health is so important and it's something that maybe people don't focus as much on as they do other areas of health with their body but it's just as critical like nina had said it is critical in balance and in other areas of life and in communication it's obviously very critical so hard for people right now struggling with hearing loss during the pandemic because i even have a hard time hearing people with a mask or trying to understand what they're saying, especially some of the thicker mask. So if you're a person who struggles with this issue, it's got to be extremely difficult, making you feel even more not apart or not connected to the people around you. Super hard for, I know some of our elderly people with the doctors and you have that health, that mask on and trying to understand and you're under a stress already. So I'm been happy to see that uh, um, more and more of the masks are coming out, like she said, with the clear plastic area over the mouth. So it does make it easier for people. And so that if you need that extra help of reading lips, that uh, that's going to be available. So we're starting to see um, a lot more of those being made. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting, those innovations that are being made in the technology and how much technology is now merging with health to be able to provide these absolutely necessary services to people with hearing loss. We'll take one more quick break. We'll review some of the most important information from our recent shows, and we'll wrap up today's edition of the Oakland County Megacast after this quick break. You're watching and listening to us on our family of TV and radio stations. Michigan, we're calling on you to save lives. Don't ignore it. Don't let it go to voicemail. It's urgent. In fact, it's critical. Because if you've been in close contact with someone who tests positive for COVID-19, you may have been exposed to the virus. And you could get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department. So please answer the call to learn how to protect yourself, your family, and friends. We're calling on you to stop the spread of COVID-19, to make it safe to reopen businesses and help Michigan move forward. So if you get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department, you may have been exposed to someone with COVID-19. To protect us all, answer the call. Learn more at michigan.gov slash contain COVID. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe alongside Ronnie Dahl in the studios of Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM. We're also on 88.1 WBFH and Birmingham Area Municipal Access with us each and every day on the Oakland County Megacast. Today we're joined online and on high definition on Facebook via Facebook Live by the West Bloomfield Township Fire Department. And recently we had Byron Turnquist, the fire marshal from West Bloomfield on, who emphasized creating a fire escape plan in your home with the entire family. He said that plans should include multiple escape routes, understanding of what to do if you are trapped in a room by fire or smoke, and a safe meeting point that does not obstruct fire rescue teams from addressing the situation or put you at risk of being, in, of being impacted by the ongoing fire. This from yesterday's edition of the Oakland County Megacast with Byron Turnquist. 
So a real simple family project to do, especially while everybody's spending so much time at home and together, is to, to sit down at the table uh, with a large piece of paper and, and just draw a rough floor plan of your house uh, that shows everybody's bedroom and all the main rooms throughout the home. And that floor plan should also show uh, the locations of windows and doors and discuss with all the family members the different options and the different ways that you could escape your house. And then when everybody's comfortable with that, um, you need to make sure that you pick a meeting place outside of the home, uh, whether it's the big rock in the front yard or it's your neighbor's porch. Uh, we tend to, to shy away from having people meet at the mailbox because when our fire trucks pull up, we're racing up right in front of the house and we wanna keep people out of the roadways uh, to keep everybody safe. Um, but pick that meeting place and then when everything's decided and planned and talked over, actually have some fire drills at different times of the days uh, and, and have fun with it and, and practice and practice because um, practice always makes perfect. Byron Turnquist with us, the fire marshal from the West Bloomfield Fire Department on yesterday's edition of the Oakland County Megacast. We appreciate having the fire department with us today via Facebook Live on our website. Well, in addition to fire safety, parents are preparing to send their kids back to school. Many are apprehensive about what happens if school goes back to being in person over the course of the pandemic. Some schools are going entirely in person. Some schools are going in with a virtual and in-person hybrid method. Others are going entirely virtual and waiting to go back to in-person schooling. And one of those school districts is the Wild Lake Consolidated School District. And their superintendent, Ken Gutman, says that with the assistance of nurse is being provided to the school districts such as Wald Lake by Oakland County. They will utilize those nurses while they're in virtual learning for the first 10 weeks of school to prepare their district for safely returning to schools with strict COVID-19 protective protocols in place. This is from Ken Gutman on a recent edition of the Oakland County Megacast. Even though we'll be virtual, we're going to begin with using our nurses to help us plan protocols and thresholds for when we do return to act as a liaison with the Oakland County Health Department, to communicate with parents, to work with our principals and administrative staff in terms of how to handle situations as they occur when we do return face to face. When we, we'll have three nurses allocated to us, and we're grateful to Oakland County, the Oakland County, excuse me, Health Department for, for providing those for us. Three nurses, 19 schools. We won't have complete coverage, obviously, but to help as a, a, an advisor, to help inform our decisions, we're educators. We are not medical professionals, so to have the availability of medical professionals to help guide our thinking will be a big advantage for, for us and for other districts across the county. Ken Gutman from the Wald Lake Consolidated School District, his district's take on the, uh, uh, or uh, his district's plans for utilizing nurses being provided by the Oakland County Health Department as schools prepare to go back in the fall, and, and Ronnie, some reassurance also for families, for kids that uh, with kids that are going to be returning to in-person learning. And Wild Lake, that's not going to happen for several weeks, but in other school districts, knowing that a lot of these school districts are working closely with the health department to maintain and, and change their protocols to prevent the spread of COVID-19 in these schools. <laughs> Tyler, I've said this before. I'll say it again. I am so glad I am a pet parent because this is such a hard time and decision making for parents. You know, some parents think the best thing for their child is to be in the classroom learning in front of a teacher. All right. The socialization aspect for their child and every kid is different. Every child is different. So other parents, they still believe remote learning is going to be the best for their child as well. But at the end of the day, it's also about the health of your child, your staff, your teachers. And so by having access to some of these nurses, it's going to at least help identify and address issues earlier than had they not been available for them. The partnership between the county and Oakland schools and the local school districts has been has been fantastic as we're leading in to the school year on coming in just a couple of weeks. They're doing great work. They're continuing to do great work to ensure as, as best of safety protocols as possible for returning kids to learning in the fall and they heavily, 
heavily complicated situation that doesn't get any less complicated as time goes on. That is going to do it for this for this edition of the Oakland County Megacast. We thank you for tuning in on a variety of TV, radio, and other media outlets. We thank the West Bloomfield Fire Department for joining us via Facebook Live, as well as our guests from the West Bloomfield Fire Department, uh, Greg Flynn from the Bowling Centers Association of Michigan, Bo Gergen, from Forteris Capital Advisors, Kevin Cronin, and audiologist Nina Lopatin from Direct Hearing, as well as our crew, Larry Nyland, our Zoom producer, Jake Kustash, our booking producer, arranging all these great lineups of guests each and every day here on the Oakland County Megacast, and all of you tuning in each and every day as well. You can find this full episode for replays on civiccentertv.com slash megacast in just a few hours. For Ronnie Dahl, I'm Tyler Keeft. Thank you for thanking you for tuning in. The Oakland County Megacast will return on Thursday at 10 a.m. for our live show.